Welcome to the Wing Life Podcast, where we talk about wing foiling and the lifestyles of those who enjoy this great sport. Anyways, hey Gary, thanks for making this happen, man. Like, uh, it was awesome to meet you in Hood and to get to know your team. Uh, so yeah, super stoked to chat. Sweet. I'm stoked to be here, Lou. So yeah, let's do this. I don't know what we're going to talk about. We'll probably go off on some crazy tangents. We could talk about all kinds of things, Baja. We could talk about, I guess, winging a bit. We can talk about the brand, Ride Engine. Talk about me. Talk about why wings rad and foiling's rad. I don't know. I'll let you go with it. <laughs> Let's start with Baja because um, I'm going to be working with La Saladita Kite School up there. They got some wing foil gear waiting for me. So they'll shout out for Ando. But, um, yeah, how have the conditions been? Ando's one of my homies. He's amazing. So you're stoked. Yeah, I love oh, that yeah. guy. Always full of totally. happiness. Uh, uh, totally. Much love. Um, dude, it's been epic down here. I mean, I've been, you know, I spend, I've been lucky enough for the past, ooh, it's going on four years now, actually. This is my fourth year that, um, you know, ride engine slash seven nation which is like the, the mothership of the whole thing they they have encouraged kind of remote working um during certain times of the year just so we could be in the market and be in touch with the market uh-huh. more so we chose la Ventana because it's kind of on the same uh time schedule as the west coast you know we're only running about an hour ahead of, of what it is on the west coast you know pack pacific time and um too it's like an epicenter of everything's going everything that goes on in terms of our uh our business you know from obviously all the wind sports stuff doesn't matter if it's kiteboarding winging you know even the windsurf side of things there's still a posse of windsurfers down here and and all things foiling like it doesn't you can get it all here the ando will probably get it all going for you too whether it's winging downwind the downwind gig um it's absolutely a magical place here because of the setup for the downwind side of things. And then whew, on the deep end of the bay where all that swell ends up on the beach, there's actually some really good prone foiling and toe foiling and, and serving at the end of the day, if there's a big Norte. So hopefully you'll score one of those. You'll, you'll get the whole enchilada since we're in Mexico oh, yeah. here. Yeah. It's chili. My favorite, what breakfast is chilaquiles. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but if you had that before, you got it, yeah, a bunch of tortillas smeared uh, with cheese and some eggs and some yeah. sauce. Boy, that's really good. Step so after a big night on the mezcal or tequila. Woo, there you go. All right, Chile. we're going to have to come visit. <laughs> so you're down there. I take it then you're a big water sports fan, given the fact that you're ride, working for Ride Engine. So how did that all start? When did you kind of meet Wind and fall in love with it for the first time? Yeah, man. Well, wind, it's a weird one for wind. We'll, we'll kind of start with the water sure. sports thing, I guess, because that, that's kind of the way it led into the, to the wind thing. But I grew up in Southern California and as all kind of most coastal kids and by generation, uh, we all shied away from the team sports side of things and really got into surfing and skateboarding and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that was it right there. Surfing was kind of my first passion and, um, started surfing at a young age and, and kept going on with that. And eventually I was lucky enough, uh, while I was actually going to university and so forth, I got a job offer in the, in the surf industry with a sunglass company. And, um, so I was able to really mesh what I, I love, you know, which was staying in the water and surfing um, and all the other things with skateboarding and snowboarding, all that kind of fun stuff too. But, uh, you know, primarily surfing, I was able to, you know, mesh that with my career and that's kind of how it all got started. So, you know, kicked it off then at that point in time and then, and just stayed in quote unquote, the action sports industry all the way through and through, um, until, uh, until I went on a little bit of a, I don't want to say a sabbatical, but my wife and myself, we moved to Peru and we opened a yoga and wellness retreat down there in 2006. Oh, no and prior to that, we ended up there for surfing for the main thing in northern Peru in this town called Mancura. And lo and behold, it's windy there basically 200 days a year. And and all my Peruvian buddies were already kite surfing. And I was like, oh, man, it looks like I'm going to have to learn how to do that. And, uh, 
you know, one thing led to another and I fell in love with, with kite surfing and the wind sport side of things. And, um, as my career developed and so forth, and a few brands that I was working for was kind of moving on to other pastures. After I moved back from Peru, I was approached by another wind sport brand to run their wind sport division. And that's how I got into the business yeah, cool. so, of the wind side of things, which I will say for the record, no matter what all you other industry people say out there, it's the hardest business I've ever been in right existence. <laughs> <laughs> Has it? In what, uh, in, in what capacity, I guess? Oh uh, man, you know, it's, it's, boy, I'll tell you what, I think winging is, is the first time is probably the sport that could crack the code to one, just creating a larger user group. I mean, that's what it is at the end of the day. Yep. You know, wind sports, um, you know, windsurfing, I wasn't a windsurfer, so I don't know much about what, what happened there other than hearsay from the legends that are still in the, you know, in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it seems like windsurfing kind of the gear outpaced the the participant at a everything from a usage a ease of usage to expense to all that to where it just became a sport that wasn't that attractive anymore and and basically crashed i mean I, that's from what i gathered from the whole thing and then you know kiteboarding came along and that was like the next you know greatest wind sport thing and it really was i remember you know before i was this is when i was living in peru and we kind of marketed the kiteboarding a little bit at our little resort and so forth. You know, we had guide trips to all the spots and, and everything with guests that were staying with us. And, you know, I'd get these little articles like fastest growing water sport, kiteboarding, woo, you know, it's the executive new golf. No, executives don't want to go golfing anymore. They want to go kiteboarding, woo. Yeah. So it was great. You know, it's like, hey, cool. This this sport is going to be the one, you know, to to achieve the heights of what windsurfing was or you know, even eclipse it. But, um, I think kiteboarding has some inherent things, you know, with it too. You know, one is you have to deal with lines and a kite and you do, you have to take lessons. No joke. Like it's a sport that you just can't, you know, go on down to your local, uh, sporting goods store, surf shop and buy yourself a kite and go throw that thing up in the sky and think you're going to survive. So <laughs> not with kiting, <laughs> you know, you do have to get some professional instruction. You know, and then it's it's limited in access at the end of the day. You know, you need a large space. Um, you know, and then number two is it's what is really cool is the kiteboarding community is really tight because it is a community sport at the end of the day. You really can't be a lone wolf kiteboarder. I mean, they're out there. Trust me, I was one in Peru, you know, where you could be self-sufficient, go to some far off beach, self-launch, self-land get yourself into a whole heap of trouble out of the water and survive yeah, it no. all. Very few of those. It doesn't happen often though. <laughs> uh, which makes it a really cool, yeah, which really makes it a cool sport though, you know, cause you know, you want a buddy with you always looking out for someone to help you land. Yep. Do all that. But it's also a barrier at the end of the day too. It's like, okay, cool. Now I need a buddy to go to this. So I'd rather just go ride my mountain bike. I can do that alone. That's whatever. true. So kiteboarding kind of plateaued out, you know, and so forth. And the, you know, now we got now we got winging um, coming into the mix, and and just the whole foil thing in general, which which I think going back to my original uh, statement of where this this industry or this market's been so hard, it's just you know we have a finite amount of participants. Yep. You know, globally, I think a lot of people can end up on some beaches, especially on the kiteboarding side. Like you drop into a place like you know Tarifa in in you know Spain, and you're like. Oh my God, kiteboarding must be the biggest sport on the planet because there's, you know, a couple thousand kiteboarders on this small stretch of beach, you know, or you, you show up on the Hood River at the event site on a busy day and you're just like, whoa, man, it's crazy. Kiteboarding must be huge. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a small user group. So, and you have a lot of brands fighting for that user group also. So, you definitely um, do. You know, I think the barrier, barrier to entry, you know, from a manufacturing side, um, it's probably quite low. Like you and me could go start a kite brand tomorrow and probably get some kite kites made or some wings yep. for that matter. Um, so the barrier to entry is quite low. I think it's, it's a shiny rad thing that a lot of people want to get involved with. So there's always kind of money floating around it that people are like, yeah, let's, let's invest in this, in this kiteboarding thing or, or what do you think and start a new brand. And so there's just a lot of brands. So you're fighting, you know, it keeps stacking on top of each other and we just need to get more participants, you know, and that's one thing that um, we're trying to focus on it at Ride Engine. Well, not just Ride Engine, just really Seven Nation, which is the mothership. They 
slingshot and ride engine, you know, we run uh, from a marketing standpoint, um, you know, even and from a product standpoint, pretty autonomously. Um, we run off separate everything. You know, we have our own teams. We share team riders. We share marketing plans. We share events. But we also do our own stuff. Okay. Um, but a big objective is is as these two brands is really trying to grow the, the participation pool. You know, and, yeah. and educate people on on you know we actually all the sports, but I think winging is the one and foiling is the one that can really drag some people in from the surf community, the sailing community. You know, it can bring people off the coastal side of things into the inside of like lakes and so forth because the accessibility is a lot uh, easier than kiteboarding, so to speak. The gear is a lot more, uh, I will say, what I believe friendly than windsurfing gear and kiteboarding gear. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of cool. And you don't, you know, obviously lessons, get taking some lessons from, you know, Ando will accelerate your- advancement and progression wing foiling to being becoming a professional wing foiler but uh it is a sport that you know you could teach buddy or or you can go out there and try to muster it on your own obviously the learning curve will will take a while but you know you you could go do it if you could swim you could do yeah, it Yeah, <laughs> it's it's less yeah you got less access issues less danger in the sense of getting dragged um Windsurfing safe, but you got so much equipment. It's really expensive. It's difficult to drag around. But now, yeah, we're curious to see if it's going to jump that like sup chasm that supping came around with. And we would love to see winging and foiling reach that where it's like every single person had a sup. That's what we're hoping for winging because it is kids are getting into it. And I don't think we've seen like, actually, maybe you're the better person to tell me. Have you seen such an accelerated growth in younger kids in sports in a long time then uh you mean specifically in wing foiling or wind sports in maybe general, like wing or, foiling compared to kiting you know, or compared to windsurfing even because like you got 14 year olds competing on tour now or 14 15 and but windsurfing you can't really get the hang of that until you got some body strength and some different stuff you got eight to ten year olds starting like i know Lessons on Vancouver Island, they start at minimum eight, but um, this is something that's so much easier for kids. Oh, absolutely. No, and I think, um, you know, we're seeing more and more kids. I see a ton of kids. You'll see them next week down here in La Ventana. We see a whole crew, obviously, in in, in Hood River, and, you know, Christopher is leading that charge on influencing a lot of kids to, to – you know, get into the sport and so forth. I do believe youth is like the lifeblood for sure. Like, um, I think getting more and more kids involved in, in the sport of winging is going to be really important for the longevity and the health of it and so Mm -hmm. forth, making sure that is a turning down sport, so to speak, or a retirement sport Yeah, (laughs) would be absolutely amazing. But, you know, think about it. The winging still is like, Cool, man, it's really new, right? At the end of the day, I mean, yeah, it's like Tony Legault, she was probably the first guy to, you know, legitimately use an inflatable wing, you know, and go hydrofoil it, or even he was trying it with a wind server way back in the day. But, um, you know, what the sport's like really legitimately been around, well, like four or five years yeah. now, right? Yeah. Maybe, 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 let's maybe even just call it three years in terms of the acceleration and like, what people are finally the gear is like hit this you know point of like everything's already pretty good you know i mean it still keeps unfolding and people are discovering new stuff and how to develop new products to make it easier make the performance higher and and so forth make it more durable but um it's still really Mm -hmm. young yeah so need to keep kind of pushing the sport and 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 getting youth involved in into creating a pathway um you know, to have access to the sport, I think is really cool. Um, you know, I watched this documentary, which is kind of a windsurfing. I don't know if you see, it's called Broken Molds. Yeah. It's a, it's a Red Bull documentary. Flights are, you know, family and all that stuff. And it's, it's really insane to see how, like what they, like one is, I didn't know windsurfing was even born in Southern California. That's really weird. There's like not much wind, but there it is. Um, but it was really interesting to see how like they got out there, you know, with this new sport and like took it to these areas. And obviously Europe is what latched onto it big time. 
Um, and doing these events that were like, you know, were a general, you know, participant can go and have a good time. And I think that's one of the things that we can kind of, I don't know what the answer is for that, what type of event it is. Maybe it's an event without a foil. Maybe it's something like that, you know, just to get people introduced to get that first sensation of like, you know, harnessing the wind and screaming across the water or putzing across the water or whatever. Cause that definitely that's, you know, a sensation and a hook that gets into you. It got into me for, for kiteboarding and now I wing oh, it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like being that energy is absolutely amazing. And I think if you could, you know, administer the first hit of that for sure. People will get addicted. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Like it's such a, so, it's such a therapy for like, you got a, a wide range of people and reasons why we do these sports, but it's such a therapy for a lot of people. And, uh, it keeps you getting up. It keeps you keeping yourself in shape, like all these different things that you need that keep you off some other paths that, that you would quite easily go down if we didn't have this stuff. So I'm really thankful for it. I am kind of curious though, what it's going to be. Is it more so all the brands come together, give a bit of more money, marketing money to something like AWSI that found like the association? Is it them that start to put out a bit more information, how friendly this stuff is? Because like if everybody is like, it, it's such a, it's a, it is a small pool, but I do feel like, I don't know, it could be the thing that helps us get over that because you can do it with a sub. You can like add that little, you can add in a, on a skeg a little bit. Like you can, you can have a decent time on that. Like Slingshot came out with that, the sup, sup winder there a couple of years ago. So there are some of those yeah, floating yeah. around. Like there is some aspect of that that could be brought on to everybody. So I don't know. I'm curious though. The gear is getting way better. Like I'm, everything is accelerating at such a rapid pace. Yeah. You know, cause I think the barrier right now, you know, would be the fear of the foil. There's definitely a fear of foil. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a, it's a pretty important thing. And, and that, that's probably the only barrier to it right now. Cause I don't think people are necessarily afraid of the wind, uh, and all that kind of stuff when it comes to a wing, but yeah, I don't know if it's AWSI, you know, AWSI is super focused on, you know, just internal trade show, you know, trade industry trade. type stuff, the GW potentially, or, yeah. um, potentially, I mean, I think those guys, you know, that whole crew, uh, Jurgen and crew are doing an absolutely amazing job at, at running events and creating a pathway for, uh, for professionals, which obviously if you're a kid and you get super into it and you want to become a professional, they're creating that, you know, that pathway to where you can, you know, have a career and, you know, as a professional athlete, hopefully in winging. So that will grow. That is true too. actually. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then that could, you know, fan out once, you know, those stories start to get out and, and, you know, people are starting to, you know, have a career in something they love, like Ween, you know, on the, the participation on the professional level, then hopefully that would, you know, drag more people into yeah, it too, right. you know, from, you know, off the coast and the, in the lakes and waterways and all that stuff and get into yeah, it. Yeah. And so. they're like, they're bringing on a bunch, like the, this year was their first year they had their surf discipline. They had their big air discipline. Like they partnered with Red Bull just on Big Air, but still that that's pretty cool. So like to see all those different disciplines to slowly grow and grow. Um, yeah, it definitely give kids an opportunity to see the world a little bit, right? And and then and then push that sport and then everybody can can kind of hop on. But how does the how does the ride engine story start? My brother's a huge kiter and I, I started my wind sports and windsurfing and I still windsurf and so we have that friendly camaraderie in a family. But he's riding, um, he's riding your harnesses, loves them, um, and does a lot of surf and stuff. So has been definitely liking that. But uh, yeah, what's this, the story behind Ride Engine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a super interesting story. Um, so uh, Coleman Buckley is the founder and he is, was, you know, in Santa Cruz. He's first and foremost a surfer also. And he ended up in, in Santa Cruz. He grew up just north of the bay area and and planted himself you know down in the surfing ep epicenter and he he also fell in love with kiteboarding and and the wind sport aspect of it and you know going to waddell every day there and he felt like there was a uh, you know as the the equipment of kites and bars and boards was you know that was progressing the the 
technology and harnesses was the same harness people were using for windsurfing back in the eighties, I guess, you know yeah. what I mean? Like there wasn't really a lot of advancement, you know, in harnesses other than putting a bunch of crazy colors on them or more layers of fake leather and stuff like that. And he was really the first one that, that brought in a, the a very high performance aspect to the harness, which is a very important piece of equipment because it's around your body, right? It's the thing harnessing your power, you know, whether you're on a windsurfer and you're, you know, using a harness or, or whether you're with a kite, I mean, you're hooked in 99.9% of the time. It's like, it's a very critical piece of equipment. So Coleman, uh, started to, he has an engineering background and he started to make custom harnesses for people. And that slowly, but surely he was doing them in his garage. He would basically send you out a uh, packet of this stuff called Instamorph. You can go buy it at your local hardware store. You would, create a slurry of that molded around your back, heat it up. That thing, it would harden. You'd send it back to him. He would create a, a mold off of that mold that you sent him to be able to, to l- do a carbon lamination around it, do a carbon lamination. And boom, you had this custom artist that was built to your specifically to your back. Be very similar to having a custom yeah, yeah. insole. Custom skates, that your, all that kind of stuff. It's, yeah. It, basically the same. So, um, he de- grew the business pretty well with that, but he was a one man show building harnesses in his garage and, uh, breathing a lot of, uh, resin and all that kind of fun <laughs> yeah. stuff. And yeah, it was trying to figure out what he wanted to do. And that's when, you know, the slingshot crew approached him and, and he ended up merging with slingshot. No way. And slingshot, uh, brand from, from Coleman. And at that point in time, it was called engine. And then when it got into the fold with slingshot or the, under the seven nation, it turned into ride engine. Uh, and this all started going down. I think Coleman's first harness he built was maybe in 2014. Oh, no way. Yeah. 13? Whoa. So this is new. Yeah. 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 He was one big young, young guy doing this stuff. Um, and it was right around 2016 is when it was brought into Slingshot. I think the first harnesses they released was like product year 26, 2017, basically. Um, and yeah, so that's that's how it all started. And, you know, they I entered the mix into Ride Engine in 2019. They didn't have specifically a, you know, brand manager or a, a brand director specifically for ride engine and they saw the growth of the brand had a trajectory they needed someone to to help that along and luckily i got the call call to do it and i was like and it was a great time because i was looking at transitioning out of what i was doing at that point in time fighting too many battles i didn't want to fight anymore and uh uh yeah so i was like let's do this you know man that sounds cool the whole thing around was to you know keep the brand ethos going that coleman you know, really out of his passion and his knowledge, you know, keep those same ethos of high performance, um, best in class, innovative product, but expand upon that product line. So take it out of harnesses and move that into wetsuits, move that into accessories, you know, things that, you know, help you connect to your board, you know, things that, accessories that help you stay protected you know so going into protection deeper and stuff like that and yeah so that's where we're at you know and we're just slow surely you know harnesses um can we talk a bit about those harnesses like what like getting picked up after a couple of years by slingshot that's that's quite a feat like not every product that goes like what made his harnesses unique comparative to everything else that was on the market yeah so i mean Really, um, he invented what's called the hard uh, shell. Harness. That's it. So by using a carbon blocking uh, in the harness, that's what created a harness revolution and made everyone fall back on their heels and go, oh my gosh, here it is. The better mousetrap has been built. <laughs> yeah. And it obsoleted everything. It really obsoleted everything on the market. It had everyone scrambling. Um, so that's really it right there. I mean, as as simple as that sounds, it was really difficult amazing idea born through building custom carbon backplates and sewing neoprene around them for, for individuals. 
Uh, so then it turned into like when when it was brought into you know to be the the sister brand of Slingshot. How do you commercialize that? You know, because obviously custom molding harnesses is going to be really yeah. tough when you when you start scaling out. We you know we want retail distribution, you know, retail partners and international distribution partners and all that. It's like oh gosh. Beauty about Coleman is he uh, definitely keeps a lot of things around, stacks of surfboards, stacks of blanks, and stacks of people's molds. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> he, pretty much, he pretty much kept every, I mean, he kept every single mold um, that he was taking. He didn't know what to do with them. He didn't want to send them to, to the landfill. He's a very environmentally savvy individual that's conscious of all that. And he's like, Someday I'll figure out something to, that I'll do with these things. But the the short story on that though is um, those molds provided a data set for Ride Engine that not another harness brand on the market has. Um, so we were able to scan all those all those um, those molds. Didn't scan them all because they were. Yeah, how many do you have? Just. Well, it was probably just over a thousand. I want to say maybe just right around okay. thousand. But we were able to scan a lot in the tune of hundreds to to basically get that what we call an average Joe or an average Jane. And two bits of information came out of that scanning the the back plates is the lower lumbar shape um, in the human you know anatomy uh, is the same for men's and women's. So that lumbar and the shape of the spine and everything is actually the same. Obviously men and women from a body standpoint are quite, you know, are mm -hmm. quite different, but, um, realize that, that, you know, to make a mold, to make a carbon shell, we can basically average all that stuff out and fit, uh, you know, what we feel is probably 99.9% .9 of the people out there with a lot better fitting harness for kiteboarding and windsurfing than any other harness on the market still to this day. So we feel ours fit way better. And I think the consumer feels so <laughs> too <laughs> that our harness fits way better than, than most of our competitors out there. Um, plus it comes with a lot of other benefits too, you know, by, you know, if you think about a shoe, if you didn't have an insole in your shoe or in your ski boot or your snowboard boot, your foot would kind of move around quite yep. a bit, you know, that filling that arch space. Lock, locks your foot in well it's the same thing in your lower lumbar filling that lower lumbar backspace um with something that's actually more rigid with support not just with filling it with that's foam, true creates a lot a lot more support around your body so especially with kiteboarding you have the kite above your head a lot um the kite's pulling to the side a lot and the that shape of the harness will lock it into place hence our technology called lumbar lock so you get a lot less twisting, a lot less rise, creating a, a harness that's way more comfortable and uh, way higher performance than, than a lot of harnesses oh, out no there. No way. So okay. that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're, out, we're expanding this stuff. You know, we did expand the line of harnesses. So now we have multiple flexes. We realize that, that people, there's riders out there that want a, a harness that has a bit more flex, but we keep that ride engine lumbar DNA through all that because that data transfers even into how we make our soft harnesses and we're actually using that in wing foil harnesses too. Yeah. I was going to ask about that bit. when we're coming into new well, harnesses that we're releasing with shaping and so forth, we're putting in, uh, some materials like curved material, which is a, a composite material that you can thermal form that stays extremely rigid. It's not carbon. Um, the beauty, beauty about it is it's really light, doesn't absorb water. You don't have to laminate it with a bunch of resins. Um, and it's perfect for wing foil harnesses and we can make an ultra lightweight wing foil harness with a ton, a ton of support and, um, you don't have to crank it down and, and it stays in place. Oh, nice. when, um, when did you guys start working on that kind of thing? Oh, uh, well, we were the, I want to say, I mean, boy, we've released our first wing foil harness three years ago. We felt an A. We know harnesses are going to be used. It's only a natural progression. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the testers for Slingshot were already using harnesses so they could be on the water longer, test up wind performance, do all that kind of stuff. Um, it was a way also to see how the wings are balanced and so forth. So uh, we were, I want to say, the first brand of, of, of uh, do you want to call it magnitude or scale or, or like 
large distribution that did a wing foil harness. I will say NSI and Hood River, you know, they came out of the wing foil harness pretty quickly and so forth. So I got to give those guys high fives, but we were pretty much, I think, developing at the same time. <laughs> they were a little bit more nimble and getting it, getting it to market. Kudos to them. But um, yeah, it was pretty much just us and them. And now you look at it and uh, every major brand out there that makes wind sport accessories has wing foil harnesses. And I do feel... Yeah, what goes into making um, like a good, like from all the R&D that you guys have been doing, what do you feel goes into making a good wing foil harness that you almost, you don't want, really want it there. It's only there when you're doing a certain purpose. And then you don't want, obviously, you don't want your board getting damaged if you're crawling onto that thing. Like there's a lot of variables that come into that, right? Yeah, totally. And, and you know, we, in the very beginning, what we, I think what wing foiling, especially for me, the, the big draw is, um, is the freedom of it, you know, like you don't need a harness at the end yeah. of the day really like and truth be told i'm kind of 50 50 on the harnesses like i'll use a harness if um i'm going up way to grip like if i'm say at home in hood river and i don't want to drive around to the hatchery and i just want to launch from the hood river side and beat my way up to the hatchery it's way easier to do with a harness oh, than yeah. without a harness, okay, you know, honest. yeah up, up wind routes like that um in certain surf situations like we do um yeah i go to peru once a year normally in september to chase oh, nice, waves man. for and uh you know a lot of the waves that are super long um offshore conditions and it's really nice to like walk yourself in a harness and just you know get right back up to the point extremely quickly and without smoking yeah. your arms <laughs> so you pull yourself in the next wave so it's like you know, but then again, like if I'm going out for a downwind or like if I'm just going to plop in the water and go for a downwind or, you know, I'm using the wing a bit to get me into a piece of swell and then pull. Obviously, the game there is to try not to touch the wing as as much as you can, yep. right? You know, just keep connecting butts. In that situation, I won't use a harness. But I do think at some point, like we always say, it's not kind of if you're going to use a harness, it's when. I think the the everyone you start looking at or start to use harnesses more and more. And it's like, once you use it once, like it took me us having to develop it and be like, okay, cool. We're going to make a harness. And then me using a harness to be like, oh my gosh, this is pretty insane. And our designer, Julian Fillion, he won't even go. Like he will go with our yeah. harness. He feels <laughs> like, no, it's on the beach. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so what goes into it, you know, when we first started developing, we wanted to emulate that freedom. You know, we wanted to make it the least obtrusive. We actually were just like, it doesn't need a hard shell or anything like that. We wanted to make it versatile enough to where you can, you know, hook a board leash to the back of it or hook your wing leash to it. So, you know, you could uh, eliminate, say, just your webbing wing leash. You know, if you're using a webbing uh, waist leash to your wing or if you're using a waist leash to your board. So we, we had features in there like that. The other thing, like you pointed out, um, you know, sliding hook was critical. So, you know, whether you got to paddle out in the beginning, you know, through surf, you can move the hook out of the way. So it doesn't, you know, if you won, you're not laying on it, right? As yep. a person, that's pretty uncomfortable. And to, so when ding your board, um, or if you get stuck with no wind and you just have to paddle go home. for a paddle, you know what I mean? You can move the, so that was, that was critical too, um, so we made in the Vinaka harness just a very uh, minimal yet supportive. So you weren't point loading a ton, you know, because you still get a, you know some pull through the through the harness line, uh, you know, wing harness. And now what we've been doing is we're realizing that a little more support is great. We could actually use a little less material to achieve it by taking some of our hard shell knowledge from the hard shell technology and applying that to a wing harness. So now we can eliminate layers of, of uh, neoprene or other padding or uh, points where we have to, to anchor per se the webbing and so forth. Cause it's all integrated with our shell okay. technology. So we can make a lighter harness more support that is actually more simple overall than our first harness that we made in the Fanaka. So it's, it's kind of cool the way that stuff is evolving. Yeah, overall. definitely. Um, yeah. 
Plus, there's other, there's other cool things coming out. I mean, everything comes around, right? Like, you know, chest harnesses. That's like starting to become a thing, I think. You know, hint, yeah. hint. Maybe um, something coming. For, for a couple interesting reasons uh, why a chest harness is a little bit nicer to use than a waist harness, namely the length of the harness oh, yeah. line. So, you know, the pain in the butt. I don't know if you've used a harness yet. I just didn't. You have to lock, lock off the harness. I didn't look the lock. Yeah. When you're starting. It was a freaking lines. Like I didn't like the fact that they were so long. I didn't want to get caught up in them if I fell. And then I already get slapped in the face with um, when I'm pumping um, some cold water. I switched to hooking up my wing harness to my belt because I run a belt for my board. Yeah. So that I found has helped a little bit. I can kind of keep it out of the way. But then it just seemed like it was, I was already tied to the board for most of us who are riding leash, because if you're on a lake and you lose, if you fall off, your board's gone. And I lost it this summer and it was a big ordeal. And thankfully it ended up at the bottom of the lake (laughs) and I didn't get, uh, like the wind didn't shift overnight. And so I said, I already have two ropes. I don't know if I want a third, but if you're yeah. you're looking at a bit of a higher harness than shorter lines and that might not be yeah i see what you're saying huh yeah yeah totally totally so there's yeah so there's all kinds of things it's ever evolving yeah man. we're everyone's chasing it right <laughs> we all are so yeah yeah so it's it's um it's pretty cool on that front you know in terms of hose oh, how the sport you know how our product line is evolving with the sport and how we're you know trying to push new innovation and technology the same way to make, make, you know, the sport more enjoyable, make the user experience on the water more enjoyable, make everyone progress faster. I mean, that's what everyone's chasing, right? Like you chase your first jive, then you're chasing your tack and then you're chasing swell and then you're chasing whatever, you know, it's like, yeah, we want to try to make that easier overall, you know, with the accessories. That makes sense. So what else is there in the wing world at Ride Engine that people should should people should know about yeah, yeah totally well um obviously everyone probably uses a wetsuit that's not specific nope. to winging but um we make a phenomenal wetsuit obviously i'm biased we feel like it's the best in the world but uh it is backed by by material science and and construction like it's it's just you know it's kind of like when you look at a great outerwear jacket you know you don't bad or not like if you want the best outerwear jacket you know, on the market, what material do you get? Gore-Tex pride, right? So like when you look now at, at neoprene, you know, we're using Yamamoto number 40, which is the highest grade, uh, sustainable limestone based neoprene known to man. Um, it has proprietary geometric structure that's warmer. It's highly elastic, easy to get on and off, which that plays in the elasticity um, we use recycled, you know, lamination for our Lycra. So, you know, neoprene is laminated on the inside and the outside. Uh, we use really nice, smooth, silky, uh, lamination of the Lycra that makes it easier to get on and off, uh, less fatiguing. It has a higher memory value. So you buy one of the ride engine on some suits, you probably have it for a few, you know, a few more seasons than a lot of other ones That's out cool there because know. it just lasts longer and doesn't bang out and get stretchy or, is not as impacted by, you know, salt or debris or getting super stiff. I don't know if you realize you let your wetsuits kind of sit over, say, the summertime. Then all of a sudden you go try to squeeze into that five, four, three, like for your first session of the winter, you're like, what in the world's <laughs> going on here? I hit the gym oh, and it's working, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we wall the hump and all stuff with, with just the material silence and using an absolutely amazing neoprene. And then, you know, construction-wise, you know, construction for uh, wetsuits, we're using uh, gluten blind stitch, fully taped suits. I mean, our, our we did have a line of suits that had this thing called power seam on them, and there's still a few out there, which is like a rubberized seam on the outside. And uh, just through longevity and durability, that seam tends to crack if you leave it in UV too long, like i.e. drying, you know, out in the baking sun here in Mexico or whatever. So we wanted to create a more durable wetsuit and just having a try and true gluten blind stitch seen with fully taping on the inside for the waterproofing is the way to go and yeah so we make amazing oh, wetsuits awesome. so which is definitely needed for waiting. yeah especially here um and the protection side yeah yeah then you know one big thing you know since i've been on board is like increasing our protection category and 
I really feel like when you look at it, you know, kiteboarding, you know, people were kind of not like, if you're wearing an impact vest, you're always viewed. This is back in the day now. Yeah. This, this even is all changing. Now, but still. You're yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, viewed, yeah. That you're a wuss. Yeah. You're kind of viewed thinking because you're wearing an impact vest. It probably means you're not confident or whatever. But, you know, when you look at winging, it's pretty much standard, like uniform. Yeah. Like an impact vest and, and helmets. Yeah. Um, but you got more things going on when you fall. Like inevitably, even if you're an absolutely proficient, amazing uh, wing foiler, you're probably going to scissor over at some point in time, right? Something's going to catch you off guard. You're going to like end up going over one side of the rail and the foil is going to come up and, you know, you might catch the foil in a place you don't want to catch the foil. Yeah. So, you know, having an impact vest is, is, you know, something that's highly recommended and obviously a, a helmet, you know, getting hit by your foil or your board is not going to do anyone any good. So, so it's a really critical part of our line that we're developing more and more around. We did develop a, a specific, um, we were really the first ones to develop a specific impact vest for hydrofoiling that crossed through all sports. So it's called the Defender HF, which HF stands for hydrofoil. And we took some of our hard shell technology and through a bit of analysis, crash analysis, um, talking to our pro riders, talking to our lesson centers that were teaching wing foiling, where people were kind of taking the most strikes overall. Oh, interesting. Um, we put hard shell protection underneath the, the actual soft protection. So you get a little extra layer of defense on there. And, and then we designed that that impact fest kind of cross into every sport. So like the way that the protection is laid out, it's really easy to paddle with. So if you had to paddle wing foiling, you don't have a bunch of stuff in your sternum um, or your lower abdomen. If you're prone foiling, it's really unobtrusive. It doesn't have a ton of soft uh, padding, but you know, it's not a life fest by, you know, that's not what these impact vests no, are No, they're for. not rated for that. These impact vests are there. <laughs> no. Yeah, they're there to, to protect, you, protect you from impact, whether it's, you know, from your equipment or any environmental impact, you know, if you fall over on the beach, I guess. But um, yeah, we're really proud of that one. And you know what the most interesting part that um, when we were talking to a ton of our riders, other other pro riders and our, you know, the people teaching lessons that they wanted was actually pat, like a hard piece in the shoulder because it carried your oh, foil. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> on your, you actually have a little piece of um, hard shell protection there underneath the soft okay. protection. So like, you know, you can't throw your, uh, you know, throw your board over your shoulder and your mass isn't just going to absolutely dig into your, you know, the top of your shoulder. So oh, yeah, no, good. Cause that is yeah. one thing. Like I carry it down. It must be like almost, I don't know if it's a kilometer, but I normally throw the impact vest on, which is super thick on the shoulder. But then as soon as it rubbed, obviously, yeah. That 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 helps, um, and the other aspects of yeah. it, impact wise, yeah, that makes sense. I've scissored twice. Year number two, I was tax both sides, went both ways, and I was teaching clients what not to do, and I just did that. So definitely saved my butt because I fell, I gutted myself, and obviously almost took the foil to the back. And talking helmets, yeah, yeah. my buddy did the same thing last year. Ripped his head open because he didn't have one on. And he was just in the water. His foil came up. He wasn't paying attention to it. He looked away. The foil, just all it did was fall down. And that's all he needed. He got yeah, rushed to the hospital. Totally. So for everybody out there, I think we are big proponents of using both those pieces of equipment. Um, it's good that there's some good R&D as well going into that because it's just going to make people's lives a bit easier and more comfortable. And what are you thinking helmet-wise, like how far down on like what what are you guys taking into consideration when you're making one of those now yeah 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 um don't want to let the cat out of the bag yeah. too big but stuff uh, that's already out or yeah. whatever <laughs> um uh, but uh what is i do think back to the neck protection is really important you know um there's a soft helmet brand out there that has like a little back of the neck protection thing which is yeah. really smart in, in my opinion, and and we're looking at working in a hard shell helmet 
with having better EVA and hard shell protection overall. That's more specific to surfing, hydrofoiling, you know, than kind of those bobblehead ones right now that are out there, you know? So, you know, you look at it like Gaff is doing an absolutely amazing job. There's another brand out there called Simba that's doing a really good job in my book. Um, and, you know, I think there's still some improvement that can be made you know, in those styles of helmets that we just might okay. be working on. All right. We can talk. We can talk later about it. Then you got to tune into the Wing Life podcast to get that information, of course, but we can talk about that. <laughs> and um, my buddy asked me, because he saw the air box and he was like, what yeah. is this thing? And he wanted to find out a little bit more information about it. Yeah, that's a thing that will absolutely make your dreams come true on the beach right um so boy it was a while ago um you know batter or not battery but like say 12 volt air you know air compressor a little air compressor for your sup they've been around forever yeah. right that you plug into your cigarette lighter or whatever it is your little 12 volt adapter in your car and you can fill it up your sup next to your car and um it's always been one of those things where I've, i'm like oh shoot I would love uh, to develop one of those, but not the smartest engineers in the room when it comes to air, little tiny air compressors and things like that. Yeah, that's and then true. All of a sudden, one day, I always I would always search out, like be like, God, someone's got to make a rechargeable pump, like something. And then all of a sudden, this thing popped up uh, on this Kickstarter gig, you know. And I'm like, holy cow, someone's doing this thing. It's like this tiny little tube thing that like, you know, is an air compressor and they're like filling up a sop and they're filling up a wing. And I'm like, holy cows, so I'm going to, you know, contribute to this thing and get one of these deals. This is amazing. And I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm actually going to call them up because they figured it out. Maybe we could do a col collaboration, you know, with with these guys for Ride Engine. And, and, you know, that was on a weird path and everything. And I started to get a little bit like concerned, like, oh, my gosh, I think pledge is probably going <laughs> um yeah. don't know if we'll ever see this pub and these people yeah i don't know what's going on here so we did shortly thereafter you know with more research we did find a vendor that was already making a, a pretty compact uh already that had the technology to do that and um so we you know brought to market a, a rechargeable lithium you know ion battery pump that will work for every single uh, major brand out there of wings, kites, fill up your subs, um, which is great. Yeah. And it's awesome. You know, you get about, whoo, it depends obviously on the size, but like wing wise, cause the leading edges are pretty big and so forth. Like you, you probably get about six to eight wings out of the thing. Kites, you can probably get, you know, eight, to, eight to 10, um, eight, 10, 12, kites out of the deal and you get probably depending on the size of the sup or the you know inflatable wing board you get anywhere from two to four okay. subs oh, all nice. and what's really key about ours for the air box um because you can buy these things out there like they're you know now they're popping up kind of everywhere right you know um but ours is very specific to the wind sport okay. industry and even though other ones kind of claim yeah, other ones will kind of say like, oh, yeah, it's going to fill all this stuff. We all know that in wings and kites, no one really has a proprietary valve, right? Like there are people have pri proprietary valves. So now there's all these different valves yeah. out there, whether it's a Duotone or a Core or a Slingshot or North, you know, the list goes on and on. We developed a proprietary nozzle set that will work seamlessly with every single brand out there. So you're not going to like buy one of these pumps, you know, you know, online, you're going to get it. And then you're like, holy smokes. Now I got to like go in and put some like, you know, duct tape, electrical tape on my gasket to make it fit with my do it till like none of that right out of the box is going to fit and inflate perfectly whatever brand that you oh, have. Nice. Okay. Um, plus we, we beefed it up a bit for our sports too. You know, like you said, you have to walk in what, like a K to your yeah, place. Yeah, it's all off grid too. So yeah. in that walk, yeah, in that walk-in, you know, you're carrying pumps, you're carrying all this stuff. Like, heck, you might drop it. It might go into the rocks. It might go into the grass. It's like whatever. So we put a shot case around it that uh, protects it um, 
somewhat from the elements. It's not fully waterproof, but it does protect it somewhat from the elements. And two, it protects it from impact. It's a lot better than just having like a regular uh, polycarbonate or, or, you know, nylon case around it. Oh, so, nice, man. Yeah. Things super yeah. cool. I'll tell you what, once you use it, you'll never want to <laughs> inflate. Oh, I got another question too for it. Like how accurate is it for, because all these different high material wing, like different materials, right? Like it'll be, this will be up to 10 or nine yeah. or 12 or like with all the Alula and all the different kind of materials that people are using now. Um, yeah. Is was, that where you're going? I was <laughs> just going with that yeah. because it's interesting, right? So like, you know, the wings, obviously I use slingshot wings, love them. And so does my wife and they need to be pumped to 10 PSI and nothing against my wife, but it's really hard for her even with a sup pump to get a wing to ten, the proper 10 PSI. So she was always running her wings, you know, super underinflated, you know? Good point. And um, so now with this, it's like you set it to the 10 PSI, you put the thing on, walk away, go put your wetty on, you come back and it's at perfectly at 10 PSI. The gauge is absolutely, the sensors are spot on. Um, and there are a lot of wings out there. I was into Motu for a little bit. I think there's some of the, you know, Alula wings um, take a little less inflation because the Alula is so stiff. But there's also some that recommend it to be a little bit like the strut to be all the way up to 12 yep. PSI. And same situation to get a strut to 12 PSI can be pretty tough with a regular. Oh, yeah, you switch. And, like, yeah, you switch one. from like two down to one. And then if you're like 120 pounds or less it's pretty hard because you, like you could literally see them start to lift off the ground a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like I said, with this, you can just, you know, plug it in, set the pressure and, you know, go do a couple other things, come back and your kit's ready to go. Oh, sweet. So okay. it's pretty yeah. nice. Good to. And, and weight wise, it's no, uh, it's at 1.4 kgs, a regular size, you know, manual pump has, like at 1.4 kgs also, other than the, you know, air box is way smaller. So it's easier to travel with. It is ion, lithium ion batteries. So if you do travel on the plane, you have to put it in your carry on. Okay. Um, you can't check it in. So similar to like, you know, GoPro drone batteries, whatever you have to like carry them on. So, uh, you do have to, you know, do that, but overall it's, it's a pretty dreamy situation. Yeah. I think it's, <laughs> Down here, everyone's fighting for for the ones that I brought down here <laughs> yeah. on the beach. <laughs> nice, man. Um, Frank also asked, he was curious about wing foil bags, um, if that was something. Yeah. Yeah, that was that we were thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we make a full uh, line of bags, obviously, for for travel. Um, call it... We have the a wing foil travel coffin. We got three sizes of that, um, which, quite honestly, you could overstuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even the small one, you know, because of the size of the wing, the wing foil boards, and then you know we made pockets and everything where you can put your, you know, your front, you know, your front wing, your fuse, your stab, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, plus, you can put wings in there, so you can get it heavy pretty quick. But yeah, we have a whole line of travel bags for, you know, for thrown on airplanes that we have a whole line of, of day bags too. Um, and what we call the, the thermal block bags for, for wing boards also, and everything from, you know, tiny low volume boards all the way up to 150 liter, you know, seven sixes, <laughs> all that stuff. They all got, you know, Velcro mass tracks and, um, dual zip, super easy to get in out of. We do put, um, different than a surf bag where a surf bag, you know, Normally they're always around four millimeters, three millimeters of closed cell foam. Uh, you know, what is called the top lid and the bottom. And then maybe on the rails, I'll put like a five millimeter foam around that. We do bump that up to where we're pretty much around the whole thing in, in our day bags. We're at seven millimeters, um, on the top cap, bottom cap. And then we're 10 millimeters around the, around okay. the rails. Um, just cause they're more awkward, they're bigger, you know, kind of bigger to move around, you know, in those, you know, 70, 80, 90 liter boards and so forth. Uh, so it provides a little more protection overall. That makes sense. Yeah. 
And then our travel bag is 10 mil all the okay. way around. And what so. do you recommend for people yeah. who, in this instance, I'm not bringing gear, but there's a lot of people getting into travel. Obviously, you've seen a ton of it. What's the best way to pack uh, your wigging gear in there to make sure that your foil doesn't go through your board? Or how? how what have you seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, boy, packing, you know, packing to travel is an art in itself, right? <laughs> Depending what type of mass connection you have, you know, to to your fuse, what your fuse is all about, what size front wing yep. you're running, you know, it's it's kind of nuts. But I'll be honest with you, I've traveled all over the world. Yeah, like I feel lucky. That's like part of my job. Oh, yeah, it's pretty definitely. amazing. Peru, a bunch of times, obviously. Went to Chile for work, went to Fiji for work. I mean, it's beautiful. I know everyone's envious right now, but it was work. <laughs> it always is. Um, but really, this is going to sound funny. I. I try to go as as light as as possible because you know you want to try to stay under whatever the weight restriction is of the airlines. Most of them are what like fifty pounds or twenty. What's that? Twenty three kgs, twenty two yeah. kgs. Yeah, they're about something like yeah. that, right? Right in there. Some of them, you know, are extending that a bit now for sporting gear, where you can go up to seventy pounds, which those are great airlines <laughs> um, that are doing that, but. You're going to laugh, but I really use my wings to pad really? everything, man. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we do have compression straps or like tie down straps on the inside. So like, you know, and the bottom is is really beefy of the bag. So like, you don't really have to worry about the bottom of the board or anything. So you chuck the board in there. And then I literally just start laying my wings out all around that board, like adding extra around the rails like i'll just shove my wings so like out of their the bags and stuff yeah yeah out of the bags that's the thing i don't travel i the best travel companion you could have for wings i believe are putting all your wings in compression ah, sacks. okay yeah <laughs> like i've seen that getting rid of the getting rid of the fancy bag that all these brands feel they need to put a fancy bag with their with their wings probably because the wings cost so much they're like well let's put this fancy backpack but for traveling, the best thing you could do is put them in compression. Just get some fried engine compression bags. Um, they're extremely lightweight. They're durable. Uh, you can layer those in that bag, you know, in your travel bag out. You know, keep your wings out of those. Use your wings as padding. I always put my mask kind of right along the top of my board and I sit it down with the, um, with the uh, straps, the webbing straps that are in the inside. And the mast plate will kind of sit off the okay, tail of my curious, board. Okay, I was curious, yeah. That's super flat, so that's not going to you know hurt anything. Um, our inside pockets on the top cap are big enough for pretty much everyone's fuselages out there. Um, so you put that in there, and then you put that all up, and I just slam the front wing on the top of everything yeah. and close it up okay. a lot. Do you take your hard handles off, or do you leave them on? That's interesting when you say that. So um, I didn't have wings with hard handles until this last trip to Peru. And guess what I did? I only traveled with two sets of hard handles, but five wings. So, you know, because some of the hard handles, with the, the especially with the wings I'm using, the slingshot ones, the smaller wings have smaller handles than the larger wings. Um, and to save on weight, and they're super easy to take yeah. on and off. So to save on, on weight and so forth, I just took two sets of handles. Risky business if you lose a handle, right? But think you lose a handle um but yeah that's kind of a little tip too you know where i was just like yeah it takes a little extra in setup like if i have to you know jump from a you know four or five to a five oh you know because those are the same size handles so i'd have to like ah oh, okay let's move it up to this one but it's seconds to do so well yeah they're all got on super that. easy bolt on yeah. stuff now and it's but I, I could see how packing that could could damage some stuff so that that was curious yeah, yeah, yeah. Just undo that stuff and wrap in the wings. The, the wing material well, it's supposed to be—it's bomber. It's, it's supposed to be. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm telling everyone the rules, but uh, it's it's not. You know, we packed it up all nice and tight in that bag. Nothing's gonna happen. Your mask very rarely is gonna rip a hole in your wing. You know, if you worry about that, like your con- you know, your mask connection to your fuselage, just throw your wetsuit top or a wetsuit around it. Okay. You know, just 
put something around the ends and yeah whoop, and put some clothes and go. stuff too and like i've never had like traveling with windsurf gear i would do it all the time and i never had any problems with it i've seen some like danger videos though where they take that stuff and they just toss it and whatever but everybody travels <laughs> with it but i okay. was curious because i haven't had the opportunity to talk um or travel yet with this stuff so that was kind of that was kind of cool um is there anything else right engine specific regarding wing foiling that you'd like to mention uh, that you think people should have or at least should know about? Well, yeah, I mean, we touched yep. on the harness. You know, we said like someday everyone's going to definitely try the harness and and probably enjoy it. The protection side is absolutely critical on that front. We talked about wetsuits yep. and bags. Um, and then we do have some really cool, what we call like connection pieces. So like foot straps, yeah, leashes okay, and okay. so forth. Yeah, let's talk leashes. Yeah, because that, like I use... A waist coil that's about whatever. For me, I've I've never had a yep. problem with it. It doesn't snap back at me because it's like a thicker coil. I like it because I feel like it's a bit safer because mm -hmm. I've lost my board twice without the leash and I don't really feel like doing that again. Especially when you're winging by yourself on a big windy long lake, you're not catching that thing. So what are your favorite yeah, kinds yeah. of leashes for both? Man, so leashes is a weird personal preference thing. Yeah, on what people do. Like, you know, for me... So for me, because I'm a server, I use a coil ankle leash to the board, a really short one. So we make a short coil ankle leash uh, so it's not flopping off in the water, yep. you know, and just making a bunch of racket off the back of the board. Some We also make a coil uh, calf leash, which is great. So you can put it around your calf. So that will also lift the leash off the, um, you know, off the deck of the board so you don't step on it as much when you're doing foot you know, when you're switching your feet, it's not going to bounce off the back of the board in the water and so forth. Um, so again, it's a personal preference thing. Both of those leashes, we have shortened them up a little bit specifically for, for weighing. So we're not just using like a standard calf sup leash and then like slamming it on your wing board, mainly to keep that leash out of the water and bounce it around. So it doesn't bounce around in between your feet. So it's not causing a bunch of racket. Um, and then we make, you know, wrist leash and waist leash wrist leash obviously would be specifically for the wing um and a waist leash that can go one of both ways right like both our waist leashes can either go to the board or to the wing. me personally uh i use a waist leash to the wing all the time uh and i really got used to that because i love surf at the end of the day and when you have to paddle out through a little bit of shore break and you have to duck dive and you got to paddle, you got to duck dive and you got to paddle to get to a clean spot to go, uh, doing that with a and wrist it's leash is a little bit tough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So waist leash for me just is like super key and I've gotten so used to it because of the wave aspect of it and then now I just use it wherever. Um, but one key thing on our waist and our wrist leash is we did put releases uh, on them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we adapted what is used in surf leashes for big yeah. wave cords because there's a, you know, like a lot of the big wave leashes, they have releases on them. Um, in case you're tombstoning for a long time, your, your, uh, board gets caught, you know, in the whitewash ball and it's dragging you along. Yeah. Like, you, you know, there's certain instances where you just want to, you know, in heavy surf situations, get away, <laughs> lose your board. Like you, um, not just hoping for your leash to break, you can actually get it away. But what I, we realized, especially this was here in La Ventana, there was a, down here in, in Ba, there was a stretch of time where there's a ton of fishing nets out in the water and really long fishing nets. And inevitably, people were getting stuck in these things all day. So they would like run into them foiling. They would go over the handlebars. Yeah. They would end up on one side of the net. Their foil is stuck on the other side of the net. Their wing is flying on this side oh, of shit. the net. Something had to go. You had to release something or get something off. Um, and we just, that I was like, man, we should just make a releasable leash. And then simultaneously, these crazy kiteboarders, sometimes they crash into you. Yes. Right. So all of a sudden you end up with a kite man. on your head and all these lines, your leash is wrapped with their lines. They're not releasing. You're going to want to, you know, release at some Cap. time, you know? Um, and the other side too is, is in the surf also, if you get wadded by a pretty good size wave and you're taking a few on the head and you're, 
you're using a, a wrist leash or even a waist leash for that matter, and you're getting, you know, drugged by your wing. Well, I was talking to Steve um, at uh, No Limits there. And he yep. was saying, like, he was in Hawaii. He he took he went out on a pretty big day, last wave of the day. And then, yeah, like, obviously he didn't have, because it was an F1 wing he was running. There was only a few. I think the only brand that that I had seen was the was Ocean Rodeo that had that release. But it's cool to know that you guys do too now. And his wing was just stuck. Yeah, and he yeah. was getting dragged under for a good, whatever, 20, 30 maybe seconds. And he was like, okay. I'm going to relax, but he's like, yeah, like, what the heck do you do with this? Because you don't want to, like, I've lost my wing just because, like, eat out of your hands, right? Like, you happen to fall into a gusty day, and I went to take it off my wrist to put it on my ankle so I could paddle in or something, and it was gusting into 30. And yeah. sure enough, bobbles, the yeah, wing yeah. hits, and poof, and there's like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> so, like, that's on that aspect of things, but the release would have been a lot easier to just boom, boom, right? Yeah, yeah. No, and it's interesting. I, I ran into a guy uh, the other day here in La Ventana. He had one of our waist leashes. He was using it to the board, but he was walking around the beach and he just had the waist leash on uh, and not the cord. And I'm like, I want to go see what happened to this guy, you know, like why he released it. And he's like, oh no, didn't you guys make it for that? Like, I just keep the leash hooked to the board like it is. And it's so easy for me to just plug the hey, thing that's back a good in point. and go. Yeah. <laughs> But like, oh my God, for <laughs> consumers, they figure out the most crafty things overall. Here we are. We think we're so smart thinking of everything. And this guy figured out a totally different adaptation that is absolutely amazing. Well, it makes so. packing it easier because yeah. right now I have that well, fairly thicker green coil leash and the, the waist. I just put it in. I don't take it off. So I'll put it inside my gear bag. But I always try to put it off to the side of the board because I don't want that thing like or any of those connections kind of smack in the back of it if something happens to do. So it makes sense. You don't want to be taking it off every time. But yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we're good with that. And then, um, you know, the other connection aspect is we have an amazing line of foot straps. Okay. Um, and we have foot straps for every flavor of, you know, wing foot strap lover out there from extremely minimalist, just EVA ones, which, you know, really were designed originally for prone surfing because they lay flat so you can lay on them um, and they don't feel like a mess on your chest. And then right when you pop up, they're supported by webbing and they pop up on okay. their own. So you can get your feet in there really quick. But a lot of the wing foil crew love those too because they're so lightweight. They don't absorb any water. Um, and then we have a whole line of other adjustable straps with Velcro D-ring adjustments, with cam lever adjustments. Um, my personal favorite is this ultralight strap, which is, it's not the EVA one. It's it's a lycra laminated one that has a little more support around the top of the foot. Um, but you adjust it just by, by the holes rather than having a, a webbing strap or a D-ring, you know, strap to tighten it around your okay. foot. Uh, and they're real nice, super comfortable easy to get your foot foot in and out of um and obviously great not just for winging but you know for toe surfing toe foiling um all that kind of fun stuff so we have really really any strap that you would decide we got for you for sure do you find for freestyle or for because I, I saw like i saw a video of balls not that long ago where he was cinching his straps pretty close together. So they were fairly narrow, but they were higher. So he could slip his foot out in case he was getting caught. Is there any strap yeah. that you see more popular in wing foiling? Or is it pretty much whatever your flavor is, you can go for it? Yeah, I think it's a flavor. Okay. One is I don't jump. Oh, I'm definitely afraid of jumping. More of a surfer myself. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, That's fair. Yeah, I I really don't use them in the surf. I did use straps yesterday. It was kind of interesting. I flit traded. Uh, boards with my friend and he had some straps on there. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I need to start using straps again. Um, just because it makes, like you can fall, man, pumping, like you can. I guess you do push I, and pull, I right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's like wearing on a mountain bike, yeah. right? Like you're, I was just like, this is absolutely crazy. I could like just pump forever. Like, so uh, that was kind of interesting, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I worry sometimes about, I get what, balls is doing um so have a kick through aspect too like i i you know as much as being able to get your foot out really quick um 
I've seen instances too where like your foot goes through the strap. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, yeah, if you have it too big, which could be really bad news and so forth. We also make a half strap. Um, oh, like I'm sure the, you've the seen hooks? those. Yeah, ones. yeah. My brother yep. learned how hooks. to kite foil on that because he went one strap in the front, almost destroyed his hip slash knee on a rotation. Mm. Said forget that, yep. and then switched the hooks, and the hooks were good for for beginning, and then he took them off later, and now he rides just, just strapless and. I ride strapless on my board too because I'm more of a surfer. So like that's what I do winging for. It's the like the free flow stuff. Yeah. And straps have I'm right there freaked me out a bit yeah. in a sense that I didn't want to be because the wipeouts have been wipeouts and winging are hilarious. They're just like these. Uh, they're they're fine. They're more catapulty than windsurfing because when you breach, you just like I almost broke my teeth one time falling forward because you fall forward from three feet and I was on, like a four or five foot set in the Great Lakes. So I'm falling like. <laughs> however many feet falling forward so i always just didn't like them for that a lot of people love straps though but anyways that it's personal preference 100 percent. totally totally yeah yeah oh man yeah yeah that um that that kind of that sums, sums it up it for up. that I mean, we're, cool yeah we'll work on a lot of other little sneaky projects which we'll, you guys will see in due time maybe you'll see some of them down here in love and oh nice yeah, <laughs> yeah that'd be pretty cool so but the other aspect of your job that we were talking about was the fact that you get to like go to all these amazing places with family and like, are there any kind of highlights of that, that you would, that you would think that people should know about or? Um, I mean, Peru, like travel wise, boy, I've been really lucky over the past few years to hit a lot of really rad spots, especially, um, boy, I'll tell you what, my, my journey to being a winger was phew, that was a tough one yeah, i was gonna ask that too <laughs> how'd that go i probably quit about uh, no less than a dozen times and i was just like Phew. and then uh finally one day it clicked uh i actually remember that day super vividly when i was just on the verge of quitting and then the the uh head of pro like a, the director of product for um slingshot this guy matt gus was in called gus he was like Siskar, you just need to do it this way. And literally, I wish you would have told me that, like, you know, fall weeks before. <laughs> <laughs> what were you like, doing? Uh, uh, <laughs> what were you doing wrong? Oh, man, I was trying to do everything too fast. Try That's one thing with winging is like, and I'm, my wife, she's going through it right now. And a couple of my friends from San Clemente, like where I grew up in California, they're here at La Ventana learning and I ride circles around them and look at what's going on. And everyone's trying to do everything so fast. Yeah. They're not like trusting the glide of the foil. They're not realizing like how far you can go and how you can slow things down, you know? And like, you know, just like in a jive, like, dude, just cruise down wind for a second. Like, you're going to keep going. And then you can be like, oh my God, there's that. And there's that. Oh, I'm going the other way now. Yeah. Like, it's like, and that's what Gus told me. Okay. It's like, you do so fast you're trying to like do kiteboard style transitions or you know surf kite style transitions he goes that's not here it's not what it's about he's like draw that stuff out i was like okay and brought it out oh my gosh there it is saw the light <laughs> nice how was tacking and stuff like heel side and toe side tacking for you for the first time dude so here i am pretty deep in my wing thing toe side tacking is totally rad like it's super fine but i tell you heel side is a tricky one right super tricky so, yeah yeah so i'm not even 50 in honest agent style i mean i'll go out and any surf for the most part i'll go rip down winders i'll do whatever but tell you what man heel side tax is still freaking something i have yet to unlock to its fullest potential yeah <laughs> I was practicing them last year. I think it was my third season and I get like quite a bit of water time on the island in the summer and regular foot I was getting them. Goofy was still the struggle. They finally started to unlock a little bit, but it's such a tricky maneuver coming through, twisting your body, getting powered up to the other side, letting your board come through without tacoing. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. Yeah, yeah it's all with Kelly. And like how you have to whip the wing. Yeah. I mean, it's so much easier on the toe side, right? Yeah, like, definitely. Well, like toe side, again, toe side is another, it was one of those speed things, right? Like you need, you need to carry fair speed to go into like, you know, a toe side tack. Yeah. Um, 
but you don't need to come around super fast. Like you can like a bit cruisier. Keep your yeah, yeah. You can keep your upwind trajectory a lot longer than you think you can. You know what I mean? And just have that thing over that grab. Yeah, 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 totally. But and I will tell you, like, so back back to the travel thing. Like, you know, uh, one is that that tacking really helps in the surf in certain situations, especially when. Like I ride surf in my natural stance, no matter what. So I'm a regular footer in Peru, which is near and dear to my heart, which I think every wing foiler, every foiler period needs to go to in their lifetime, whether they go toe at Chicama and they'll just have their mind blown that place because looks that's phenomenal. like go foil heaven or whether you wing up in Northern Peru at a place like Negritos or, or Trace Cruces or something like that, where you just get on a wave for, you know, forever you know and it's the, the wing sits behind you because it's offshore side offshore and you're just like what's going on here i'm just rode away for a mile you know <laughs> yeah that'd be um, phenomenal. but i ride you know i'm regular footed they're all left in, in peru and i still love to ride backside like i never switch my feet i mean i switch my feet but like even kite surfing i wouldn't always just try to ride front side like i really would like like riding you know on my backhand and winging is the same way for me. Um, I still love riding waves on my backhand, uh, mainly because like when you carve backhand bottom turn, it feels super cool. When you come off the top, you're like leaning down into the wave, you know, and it's yeah, it's really cool. But that upwind, like toe side tack, is pretty key when you're a regular footer in the lefts. <laughs> yeah, so you're not always turning away from the wave, so you can actually turn it into the wave way quicker. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Going down the line like that, you would have to. Yeah, definitely. You don't have really have a choice. What are you gonna do? Jive? No, not really. Like it's easy. Yeah, yeah, totally. Huh? All right. So Peru's. Yeah. When you can just flick the thing over and like be right in the pot, you know, right in the right spot, it's amazing. Yeah. Key key word. Yeah, I would say (laughs) key uh, word. It's amazing if you can get it done. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, but yeah, I would say Peru bucket listed for wing foilers yeah. and, and, you know, just foiling in general. I mean, this place we go to in Northern Peru, like we unlocked a couple just absolutely amazing downwinders, um, there, which, you know, I'm telling all my sub downwind buddies, like it's, it's mental, you know, cause like sup downwinding, you know, in at the river is one thing and like that really short period kind of like high wind river type you know energy swell energy and then all of a sudden you get in a situation where you're like in actual swell energy like you know and you're out in the middle of the ocean and you're riding like 21 22 second 1.5 foot swell you know it's like and you go forever it's just with a wing you know all that kind of stuff it's like an absolute different experience and there's some downwinders in northern peru you know 14 50, 14 18 you know, geez you can go from this one place all the way to mancra 20 miles long that are just magical absolutely magical you can kind of get it all right you can get the surf go surf your foil you know wing foil and surf your brains out you go toe foil your brains out then you go downwind your brains out not so bad no <laughs> and the water's and the water's reasonably warm. So yeah, like yeah. What kind of suit? Most three two would be the max. So oh, man, that's most that's of the time. sunshine. <laughs> well, hey man, is there so, anything else you want to chat about? Or do you want to wrap this thing up? Or yeah, man, no. I mean, uh, it's been awesome, awesome talking to you. Absolutely, I'm honored, and you have reached out to have me on this on your uh, podcast. That's really cool. And um, yeah, I'm just really stoked to be able to talk about Ride Engine and wing foiling and how stoked on it i am myself man it's it's uh it's really weird like to witness i mean i feel like i didn't really witness the birth of kiteboarding or like because i kind of started late in the kiteboard thing but to see a new sport emerge and and be on the front edge of that because i work in the industry and be able to design you know products for that um, and work with our designers and, and engineers to make that stuff. It's super cool. You know, growing our, you know, spreading this, the, the magic and the stoke of, of this wing foiling thing and is really important. And it's cool that you're on that same wavelength, you know, to get more people 
you know, not just involves our businesses on grow, but just yeah. involve because it's man, it's super fucking fun. Yeah, like, it gets insane. Right? Like, I mean, I have met people down here where it's like, you know, here we are in this young wing foil thing, and it's like changed their lives. Like they're, yeah, you know, chasing it, reshuffled the whole deck of how they do their work so they could be here to just, you know, participate in in wing foiling. It's pretty rad so if we can keep spreading that vibe yeah it'll be good yeah good time definitely yeah. definitely well hey man well hey thanks for thanks for meeting today and chatting and uh thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll catch you guys all next time awesome man later